So also, believe it or not, at this uh, point in the class is really when we're supposed to be covering defibrillation and, and transcutaneous pacing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're, we've already covered it in lab. Thank goodness for that time that we did have in lab. Um, so you should be pretty, uh, pretty understanding of defibrillation. Do make sure that you understand uh, the difference between a monophasic and a biphasic machine. Um, with monophasic having to deliver one shock at much higher dosages, that's the older type of uh, machine, and then the biphasic uh, delivers two lower dosages and is much more efficient. Um, synchronized cardioversion uh, is going to be different than defibrillation. Now, I know that y'all know all this stuff. I'm just wanting to review it with you. Um, is going to be different in defibrillation in that defibrillation is called unsynchronous cardioversion um, and it delivers the elect uh, electricity at the uh, at anywhere during the cardiac cycle whereas with um, synchronized cardioversion it delivers at the peak of the R wave. Now you also can deliver um, synchronized cardioversion for a wide complex with a pulse like a, a VTAC as long as it is organized in single morphic but a polymorphic VTAC like uh, torsades you're not going to be able to cardiovert even if they do have a pulse you're going to have to defibrillate because the machine cannot actually synchronize up on an R wave. Um, <clears throat> The precordial thump. The precordial thump. Um, I remember one time I was doing um, clinicals in the ICU years ago in paramedic school clinicals, and um, I'm sorry, I didn't know my screen wasn't up. Um, Y'all see my screen now? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, I'm terrible at technology. Um, remember what? You, you, don't, you, you should see the presentation now. Do you not? Yeah, he's about to, he's about to assault him. I think... I seen it. I seen it. Um, well, yeah, I'll tell my story while you're doing that. Uh, so I was, I was young, you know, I was 18 years old going through paramedic school. I was sitting at the nurse's station. We did clinicals in the ICU back then. And I heard the monitor. I didn't have really a clue what was going on. I heard the monitor beep, 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 beep. And I saw the nurse get up and run in and punch the, the dude in the chest. And I was like, what the crap is going on? And she tried a precordial thump. It, it, I've never really seen it work now. It's one of those things where you can talk to all the old medics and all that. I guarantee you, I've seen it. I've seen it work every time. Works better than amiodarone or works better than shocking. Whatever. Uh, it's not an acceptable uh, treatment modality in um, your your cardiac arrest management. Um, uh but I just I thought it would be um, necessary to tell you about it so that you uh, didn't know or or that you didn't know what was going on if you saw somebody punch somebody in the chest when they were in cardiac arrest. <clears throat> with TCP, just again make sure even uh, with TCP and synchronized cardioversion, remember uh, you want to make sure that that patient is comfortable if possible. Um, and make sure that they, uh, you know, can tolerate any type of analgesia or um, sedation medication. Now, if they can't tolerate it at first, but you start transcutaneous pacing, be sure that you're prepared to maybe administer it once it starts working the way it needs to work. Um, because that's the whole point is to gain cardiac output and, uh, you know, for them to start uh, perfusing better. 
okay? So I'm not going to go through the steps there. Carotid sinus massage. This is something that I've seen, and it's actually something that used to be a, a common treatment for uh, us in the field as part of your vagal response. Now we do the other things, uh, mainly because uh, the carotid sinus massage, it converts uh, uh, possible uh, SVT into sinus rhythms by stimulating baroreceptors in the carotid bodies. Um, but two things were happening. Folks would get uh, overly aggressive. Folks would get overly aggressive and they would use both fingers and they uh, start massaging. Uh, and uh, then they would cut off blood flow to the brain. Or it might be somebody that, that has a, a, some plaque built up in the carotids and so you know, yeah, they're in SVT, but now you've caused them to have a stroke as well. So, um, you know, it, it's um, it, it's really you can you can try to do other things first, uh, vagal maneuvers as far as you know, trying to get them to bear down on a closed glottis or whatever. All right. Um, on the support and communication with your patients, uh, it's very important, especially if they're having chest pain, that you treat chest pain especially if they are um, within that uh, within that area of um, you know like within that window of, of the the typical population treated as cardiac any chest pain until proven otherwise also if you've got a patient that you feel like is tried and true having cardiac issues and they tell you that they're about to die in just a few minutes they're probably going to so you need to take them seriously um, they, they they know when their chest is hurting them really bad. Of course, you you want to try to make sure that, that they don't do that, but um, you need to um, completely be honest with your patients when you you know let them let them know what you're afraid of with with what's going on with them. Also, um, I you know there are there have been several circumstances where um, I distinctly know of several circumstances that with folks that I've I've worked with before that had got called out 911 chest pain the the person was stubborn they didn't want to go to the hospital sign a refusal and then then you know within an hour or two or maybe later that night you're going back and working a code on them um so you know there's a lot to say about your gut um there's a lot to say about that feeling that you got in your gut uh whenever you um are uh uh treating a patient and if something don't feel right you need to make sure that you convey that to that patient because um it's a pretty bad feeling to get, get somebody to sign a refusal and then a little bit later you're going back to uh, have them um in cardiac arrest so um so uh just uh, make sure that, that you're dealing with your patients in, in the appropriate right way. All right, so we're going to uh, go back just a little bit uh, to, to the things that possibly could cause ACS. We, we talked about ACS with 12 lead, um, but backing up just a little bit to the things that could possibly cause ACS, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, the most common, uh, one of the most common forms of uh, heart disease, um, and obviously if the coronary arteries become blocked, uh, with plaque and, um, um, and blood flow, uh, stops, then of course we are getting, you know, ischemia and all of that. So, um, you can also have, um, other issues, uh, where, um, uh, you have cardiac vasospasm that's not necessarily, uh, because of plaque, uh, because of reduced blood flow, um, maybe even a stimulant or drug-induced like cocaine. <clears throat> know the difference between athero atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, this is going to um, affect the inner lining of the aorta and uh, cerebral and coronary blood vessels. This is where you start having plaque built up, which leads to the narrowing of blood flow and blood flow reduction and um, it provides an area for the formation of a fixed blood clot or a thrombus or um, may um, be, um, you know, plaque and all that. Um, it may cause uh, arteriosclerosis, which is different than atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis being the breakdown and the hardening of the other arteries. Um, so um, 
know that. Um, know the intrinsic and extrinsic factors for uh, atherosclerosis, such as your uh, intrinsic uh, being the things that, that really can't be controlled um, or non-modifiable risk factors, um, your gender, um, your, your genetics, other things that can be controlled though, smoking, that's the number one cause, uh, hypertension, cholesterol issues, um, sedentary lifestyle and modification, um, lifestyle modification. Um, atherosclerosis uh, is a major contributor to uh, your uh, peripheral vascular diseases. So there is a difference between coronary artery diseases and peripheral vascular diseases. Peripheral vascular diseases is going to be within the extremities, uh, upper and lower extremities. This is where you get your DVTs and things like that, whereas your coronary artery disease is going to particularly affect the coronaries, which is going to be one of the main reasons why it's more prone to cause um, MI and chest pain. A couple of terms that go along with this, you've got uh, the arterial brewies. Uh, you should have learned that in EMT when you were talking about... Um, um, assessing the neck or either listening in on a, a dialysis shunt, the uh, swishing sounds heard uh, over the carotid arteries. Uh, claudication. So claudication, this is going to be severe pain in the calf muscle. You may also see redness or maybe even see like um, a uh, pallor type palish color um, within the calf as well. So we know that that could be indication of DVT. Um, and then also phlebitis, which is going to be swelling along the vein and pains along the veins as well. Now, deep vein thrombosis, this is not going to be arterial. This is going to be venous. And so if a DVT breaks off, it's going to travel venous system and end up in the right side of the heart. Um, and then um, it's going to, you know, make its way most likely around to either the pulmonary vasculature. If it makes it through the pulmonary vasculature, it could make its way up to the cerebral vasculature um, causing stroke. All right. Uh, a lot of the same risk factors for peripheral vascular disorders. Uh, Pre-hospital treatment's limited. If you've got somebody you suspect of uh, DVT pain, uh, the big thing there is is you want to make sure that you're not moving them around a lot to where it would dislodge uh, possibly aspirin, IV access. Um, don't want to do high fluid boluses or anything like that. All right. Um, a thromboembolism may completely block a vessel or it may um, lodge on the side of the vessel wall. Um, there's another video here about angina or angina. Um, you've got um, several different risk factors for angina. Um, again, we treat all chest pain as cardiac in nature chest pain unless uh, um, otherwise noted. Um, <clears throat> your uh, principal symptom of coronary artery disease is going to be angina. Uh, you've got stable and unstable angina. Uh, just uh, well, I was going to say just as the video mentioned just a minute ago, but you didn't hear the video. But uh, lactic acid starts to build up within the coronaries uh, because of the process of anaerobic metabolism. This is what's causing the severe pain. Also, the, uh, the decrease in cardiac output is going to cause the shortness of breath and, and uh, the pain, the, tre the chest pain, the, the, the difficulty breathing, probably altered mental status, things like that. Now, there is a type of angina called Prinz metal angina, uh, Prinz metal angina, which is actually uh, almost like the heart attack version of a TIA. Um, Prinz metal angina caused by a coronary artery vasospasm uh, causes chest pain at rest, but then then typically it resolves. Um, but just like with TIAs, it could be a precursor to other things as well. So again, having chest pain, let's take it seriously. Even if it gets better, um, we're going to still follow the same guidelines there. I'm sorry. Um, Knowing the difference between stable angina and unstable angina, um, stable angina uh, relieve with rest, uh, relieve with nitro. Um, stable angina sometimes can be 
something that folks experience and it's not an acute situation. That's why folks are often prescribed with home nitro and things like that. Unstable angina, though, this is going to be more of a sign of, of impending MI. Um, patients having chest pain that, that is, is not resolved with rest, is not resolved with nitro, is not resolved with the other things, we definitely need to be getting the 12 lead and moving on. Um, just to reiterate what we had talked about last week, and I'm going to move on past this, but you, you should do a 12 lead on all of your chest pain patients. Q-wave MI, ST elevation with a Q-wave MI. Non-ST elevation um, or uh, unstable angina with a non-ST elevation. So again, this is going to be that chest pain that's not relieved. Uh, you think it's cardiac in nature, uh, but there is no ST elevation. Or you could have ST segment depression or no changes at all. Um, you could have ST segment depression and like leads V1 and V2, but no ST elevation anywhere. Um, but the bottom line is, is that if you do see changes, or if you don't see changes, if they're experiencing unstable angina, we treat it as unstable angina and we treat it, you know, according to your cardiac um, protocol there. So, um, any questions so far? I see, sorry. All right, y'all hanging with me? All right, cool. Okay. So <clears throat> we didn't get real deep into the patho of AMI. So I do want to just quickly talk about the, the tissue and the wall uh, so that if you kind of see what you're looking at and why you're worried about the tissue and the wall there, uh, then you can understand why recording on the horizontal plane would be um, important. Okay, um, the location and size of your MI uh, depends on which artery is blocked. And I think I covered that pretty well, talking about the left side or the right side. Um, <clears throat> you may have what's called a subendocardial myocardial infarction, where only the inner layer of the muscle is affected. Or you may have a transmural. The transmural is going to be when the infarct extends all the way. So it's extended all the way and it's really affected that rigidity of the, the cardiac wall. Um, so this is an example right here of the tissue that's all the way through, so a um, transmural infarction there. All right. Um, chest pain um, is the most common symptom with this, but you're not always going to have chest pain. Um, you may have non-typical um, signs and symptoms. Um, Patient often um, clenches his fist when describing the pain. You want them to describe it. Don't don't lead them with questions like, "Does it feel like an elephant sitting on your chest, or does it uh, feel like uh, you know indigestion or something like that?" Y'all have heard my statement on indigestion before. Uh, you know, <clears throat> indigestion has killed a lot of uh, middle-aged stubborn men because they won't go to the hospital because uh, oh, it'll get better once I uh, take some tums. Um. <clears throat> but it doesn't, even after a couple of days. Um, <clears throat> other patients, other type of patients that may not experience um, the typical signs and symptoms are going to be um, women oftentimes will, will not experience your typical signs and symptoms. Um, they may present with nausea, lightheadedness, um, weakness, tiredness. I actually had a patient in the ICU uh, that she was just up there us monitoring her after she had... Uh, been working in her uh, yard all day long, uh, raking and all of that. And uh, as she was laying down that night, she had uh, started feeling some pain in her back. And she thought that it was just uh, uh, 
muscle spasms or, or, you know, pulled muscle or something like that. It was nothing that would even give her any type of indication of, um, of MI or anything like that. And so she, uh, it, it kept getting worse and worse though. And she went to the, uh, uh, urgent care, just thinking they would give her some, um, some um, muscle relaxers, but thank goodness they were, you know, onto something there, and they actually um, did an EKG on her, and then um, sent her on to the hospital, and she ended up in the cath lab with massive STEMI. I don't remember exactly where the STEMI was, but she ended up in the cath lab with massive STEMI, and the only pain that she felt was like lower back pain um, from, you know, that felt like um, a muscle spasm or a pulled muscle. So. Um, <clears throat> It may uh, may be non typical pain, so um, <clears throat> one of the things that you're really going to have to uh, uh, really work on in in your your paramedic practice is really putting together these different types of calls that you've run and that you've seen, and get really developing your your intuition on this because sometimes you know that intuition may be the only difference between a refusal and then them uh, calling you back or somebody calling you back later because they're in cardiac arrest. Um, <clears throat> so, um, a lot of times, uh, with AMI, you're going to see signs of left heart failure, maybe pulmonary edema, maybe, um, it could be hypotension or hypertension because of the, uh, the anxiety and the, uh, uh, pain and all of that. The feeling of impending doom though, um, like I mentioned earlier, the feeling of impending doom for somebody that is actually experiencing these issues, uh, you need to take that very, very seriously. If they have already taken a nitro, um, make sure you uh, ask them how much they've already taken. They've already taken their aspirin, ask them how much they've already taken, and then at least match the dosages to get you the right pre-hospital dosage with the aspirin or the nitro. Uh, make sure it's in date too because expired nitro, uh, stale nitro is not going to be any, you know, it's not going to be worth anything. <clears throat> okay. Just make sure you're taking notes of the different things with your patients. Left heart, uh, left sided heart failure sign, right sided heart failure sign, um, and I'm going to get into that in just a minute too. Okay, so uh, your treatment goals, uh, like we had talked about last week, limit the size of infarct. Do this by administering aspirin. Keep that clot uh, from getting bigger. Uh, do this by administering nitroglycerin. Open up the uh, the coronary arteries to allow for more blood flow. Um, decrease fear and pain. Do this by, um, you know, giving them calm re, uh, reassurance, um, giving them um, analgesia, uh, giving them, you know, something, ketamine or something like that that's going to help calm their nerves. Um, and then also continually monitor them. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, don't uh, forget about asking about your PDE5 inhibitors, which are your... Um, your uh, potent vasodilators uh, that are often used for erectile dysfunction, uh, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. But you do need to understand that sildenafil or vardenafil or tadalafil, these may actually be given for somebody that has blood pressure issues. Um, they may not be able to um, take the other medications or they may be refractory to the other medications. So they may actually be on these types of medications. So not everybody that takes these medications are taking them for sexual purposes. Um, I mentioned the dosages on morphine and fentanyl and all that last week. Um, one of your big things though that you've got to be thinking is reperfusion therapy. Uh, so time is muscle. You want to get them into the uh, hospital as quick as possible. You want to get them um, to the cath lab as quick as possible. So one of the things that you're going to need to do is really get a good 12 lead, get uh, that sent on to the hospital and get a good assessment and a good report. Uh, the, the less time that they can spend in the hospital, I mean in the ER, and the more time that, that they've got to get or they're able to get to the cath lab, then um, they are uh, you know, going to be much better off. Um, <clears throat> a couple of different reperfusion techniques, fibrinolysis, 
this is going to be the clot breakdown. This is why we're going to do the um, the twelve. I mean the uh, pre-hospital fibrinolytic uh, checklist. Uh, they say within an hour of onset, but the doctor may choose to um, do you know whenever we're going to follow protocol and we're going to uh, go ahead and do the uh, checklist and all that. Anyways, there are some pre-hospital areas that were trialing um, fibrinolysis uh, under control of the medical uh, control, but um, this is not, you know, anything around this area. You've got a couple of different types of um, clot uh, dissolving enzymes, um, uh, altaplase, uh, streptokinase, and retoplase. All of these are ones that they may use in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> PCI, this is what, what you probably saw in the uh, cath lab for those few of you that did get to go. A um, couple things that they may do within the uh, cath lab. They may uh, go in, they're going to shoot the dye to try to find out where the clot is. And then they may go in and uh, just do a balloon in some situations where they just balloon out and open up the vessel. Um, most situations they usually put a stent like you see there which is a metal uh, mesh that actually has uh, uh, medication like impregnated in it and on it uh, to keep it from forming a clot um, <clears throat> and that's to keep the uh, the vessel open right there so it opens the block artery so another video I would do these uh, I would open this up and look at those videos if you have time um, this is just an example of the uh, pre-hospital checklist uh, for your 12 lead. I meant, I'm sorry, not for your 12 lead, for your STEMI. A um, couple of things that, that are going to be characteristic, chest pain or equivalent characteristic of MI for at least 30 minutes. Pain is not lapsed and is not relieved by nitro or position changes. ECG uh, shows ST elevation of at least one millimeter and at least two contiguous leads reflecting a single myocardial region. Um, Q waves are not a contraindication. And then elapsed time from onset of ischemia to evaluation is less than 12 hours. Um, even if it isn't, uh, you still fill this out and let them make the, that clinical decision. Now there's a good bit of uh, uh, exclusion criteria any type of uh, bleeding, any type of, of, you know, uncontrolled hypertension, pregnancy, obviously, um, things like that. Anything that, that, any type of procedures that's occurred recently that, that may, may make them bleed. Remember that the medications that they're going to give, the, the alteplase or the streptokinase or, or something like that, is systemic. So it's not, it's going to have its target tissues of that clot, but it's also going to affect the body system wide as well.